Uh, good morning, everyone. I think it's uh, it's 10 o'clock, so it's, it's 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 time to start with the lecture today. First um, lecture today about the heart is um, uh, uh, given about the external description of the heart. I will talk about the cavities and the valves a bit. And also um, I would like to talk about the wall, the structure of the wall. And um, finally, I have two slides about the projection of the heart and the X-ray uh, of the heart. These are the topics to be discussed. Um, the first uh, part of the lecture is about the uh, location of the uh, of the heart. Um, let's start with that. Um, in the coming weeks, um, in the dissecting room, you will you will start to uh, to dissect the thoracic cavity, and you will cut the ribs, and you will also cut the sternum. And uh, after this, um, uh, you will be able to remove the anterior wall of the chest. Uh, and uh, after this uh, procedure, you will see the two lungs. And uh, if you if you separate the two lungs, uh, you put them to the lateral direction, you will see a midline cavity of the thoracic cavity that is called mediastinal space. So in this uh, mediastinal space, um, uh, you will find the heart that is uh, surrounded by a specific connective tissue structure called pericardium and um, this pericardium is uh, situated uh, in the uh, so-called cardiac part of the anterior mediastinal space. Um, I do not have time now to talk about the anatomy of the mediastinum. This is typically a, a subject or part of the anatomy which is discussed in the uh, practices and your your uh, uh, instructor in the classes will tell you a lot about the mediastinal space, but uh, a couple of years ago I wrote a handout about the mediastinal space. Um, we made this because uh, the uh, classification of the mediastinal parts are not uh, always the same, so please uh, uh, check this uh, file uh, in order to avoid misunderstandings in the exam. So uh, we are talking now about the, one of the most important contents of the anterior cardiac part of the mediastinal space. More details about mediastinum you will find in this handout online. So if I would like to um, show you the heart, I have to take the scissors and I have to cut the pericardium and the, car the heart is situated within uh, the pericardial space inside the cardiac part of the anterior mediastinum. Now, uh, if we would like to uh, discuss the heart and we would like to describe its external surface, we have to study at least two views. First, I would like to demonstrate the anterior view of the heart. So imagine that you are looking at this heart um, now from an anterior direction, like there would be a person facing you and you are looking into the chest of uh, that particular person who is in front of you and facing to you. So that's why the right side <clears throat> of the uh, the right side of the um, of the heart is for us on the left now, but we are always referring to the sidedness of the patient or of the heart. You are, we are talking about and not our right side, but the right side of the heart is uh, is discussed. Now, uh, the, I marked or highlighted the directions in order to help your uh, orientation. Um, first of all, uh, if we check the heart's external surface, one can find here a groove. That groove is the so-called coronary sulcus. I will come back to this point next week when we discuss the coronary arteries because they will run at least in part in this uh, in this groove. But now we need this groove because above this groove we will find the atria. Inferior to those we will find uh, the ventricles. Then um, if we have an anterior view to the human heart, one can see a more or less flat surface that's facing to the chest bone and to the ribs. That's why we call it sternocostal surface. And uh, um, inferiorly, you find a border that is in a fixed cardiac um, uh, preparation, um, uh, more or less um, sharp. However, in a fresh cardiac uh, tissue, it's more rounded. It's the right margin or right border. It's uh, situated more inferiorly than on the right side of the heart, but because it belongs to the right ventricle, one calls this right margin or right border. But I will come back to this point where are the cardiac cavities behind these surfaces. And then you have here a surface that is facing to the diaphragm. That is therefore designated as the diaphragmic surface. 
but at this aspect one can see hardly this surface just a very oblique view is available but i will show you the posterior view of the hardware you will uh, study this much more uh, efficiently and then finally um, before we go on uh, on the sternocostal surface one can find a groove that accommodates uh, blood vessels there is the uh, so-called anterior interventricular groove and um, this anterior interventricular groove accommodates branches of the um, of the coronary arteries which uh, will be uh, very important for the blood supply of the heart i will talk about it uh, next week more uh, detailed and um, also to maintain the orientation on the uh, on the heart one can find the apex of the heart um, which is uh, um, the tip uh, of the heart it's like like the cone and the tip of the cone um, one can find also the movement of the apex of the heart in the thoracic wall so this is the anterior view external surface now let's remove some of these uh, anatomical uh, landmarks and let's just keep the green mark the green highlighted coronary sulcus and the anterior interventricular sulcus after this um, i can show you where are the cavities of the heart behind these uh, surfaces as i mentioned earlier right above the coronary sulcus one has the atria and on the right side there is the right atrium situated and obviously there is a structure bulging out from the right atrium which has uh, uh, some similarities with the shape of an auricle that's why it is called as the right auricle um, the blood comes then from the right atrium further down into the right ventricle the right ventricle you find below the coronary sulcus and on the right side of the anterior interventricular sulcus please note the right means now uh, the right side of the heart. So this light blue highlighted area is the wall of the right ventricle. And as I mentioned, the right margin uh, is down there. Uh, this is why um, we call this uh, right uh, margin as well. Uh, from the right ventricle, the blood is pumped into the pulmonary vessels, into the pulmonary trunk, which carries uh, the oxygenated blood and it carries that into the lungs in order to refresh it, to reoxygenize. And after this event, the blood returns to the heart and it is drained into the left atrium. But in an anterior view of the heart, one can see only a very small part of the left atrium, which is uh, again somewhat ear shaped. That's why we call this uh, left auricle. If I will come to the next uh, next slide, I will show you the back view of the heart there. The left atrium uh, will be much more obviously recognizable. It's a larger area on the back side. And after this, uh, the blood from the left atrium continues into the left ventricle, which is again available and visible on the anterior view of the heart. But again, it will contribute to a smaller surface of this uh, area. But you will see that on the back side, it will uh, occupy more uh, space. So this is how you can imagine the cavities of the heart behind its surfaces in an anterior aspect. Now, Viacciolo, let's turn the heart around. And at this moment, you are looking uh, at the heart from a posterior inferior view. Like you would have a patient in front of you, you are looking at the back of the patient, but you wouldn't see the, 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 the uh, spine, but you would see the heart in a posterior view at the moment. Therefore, on the left side, indeed, you have the left part of the heart and on the right side you will have the right side of the heart so again the landmarks for orientation i have to show you um, first of all this surface which seems to be quite irregular um, has the blood vessels which enter and uh, exit the heart but if you cut them short enough you can put down the heart on the table quite uh, stable on this surface that is why one calls this cardiac base or base of the heart and then um, uh, the coronary sulcus is visible again. This is continuous with that coronary sulcus I showed you in the anterior aspect again. Um, and uh, we are now having a very, very nice access to the diaphragmatic surface that's facing to the diaphragm. As I mentioned earlier, in an anterior view, you don't see that very well, but in a posterior inferior view, obviously you can see the diaphragmic surface much more efficiently. And then Again, you have a groove on this surface that runs uh, 
on the back side of the heart. It's again between the ventricles. That's why the name interventricular groove, but we are on the back side now. That's why one calls this posterior interventricular groove. And again, you can easily identify the apex of the heart again in a posterior view. So this is the posterior view of the surface of the heart with some anatomical landmarks. And again, let's remove them and let's just we keep now the coronary sulcus in place and the posterior interventricular groove or sulcus. And um, now let's try to imagine where are the cavities in the background. So above the coronary sulcus, one has the atria. And on top, we start with the left atrium now. Uh, please note that there are four blood vessels indicated on this and they drain into the left atrium. These are the pulmonary veins. But uh, this is a little bit tricky now. I have to I have to explain you the situation. So, um, however, people use here the red color uh, in the atlas. These are veins because according to the definition, blood vessels which enter the heart, regardless what kind of blood they carry, they are uh, considered as veins. And these are the pulmonary veins. And since they carry oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium, they are in some atlases indicated in red color as the fresh oxygenated blood has a more cherry red color. That's why the, the, the coloring of the pulmonary veins here, as I mentioned, they drain into the left atrium. Um, as I <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, the left atrium occupies a larger surface on the back side, and just the auricle is visible in front. And one more remark here: this area um, has a closer relationship with the esophagus, and uh, that has some clinical significance as well. Because if you want to obtain really high quality ultrasound images from the heart, one can approach the heart from behind by uh, introducing an ultrasound transducer into the esophagus of the patient and you can collect esophageal um, ultrasonography images from the heart because of this close relationship with the esophagus. But you will talk about this um, in your classes as well. So that's the left atrium and then the blood goes on from the left atrium down to the left ventricle. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the left ventricle has a larger surface on the posterior uh, surface of the heart and it is situated on the left side of the posterior interventricular groove. Now, uh, the right side of the heart uh, receives two huge veins. The superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava collect the venous blood of the entire body and they drain into the right atrium. Um, the right atrium um, has a connection to the right ventricle that has a larger surface anteriorly, as I mentioned earlier already, but therefore it occupies a smaller area on the posterior inferior aspect of the heart. That's the right ventricle here. Now you can imagine where are the cavities behind the surfaces uh, of the heart. And um, after this, um, let's cut off the heart and let's go into the cavities a bit. And if you take the scissors and you cut off the right side of the heart, you get this, you get this kind of preparation. Similar ones you will also do and <clears throat> make in the classes. So uh, in the dissecting room on the top, you have the right atrium now. The right atrium, one can divide immediately into two areas because one, and that's the larger one, has a pretty flat wall. And uh, this has a developmentally different origin you will uh, get this explained in the lectures about the cardiac development in the um, embryology uh, series of lectures. Uh, this area is designated as sinus venarum cavarum. It means the bay, the sinus of the uh, large veins, the superior and the inferior vena cava will both drain into this space. And you have a smaller area of the right atrium that is different in its uh, structure as it has a uh, the muscle uh, bundles embedded in the wall uh, and that's the atrium proper or some people say it's the same as the right auricle. Uh, you can use these terms um, as synonyms as well. But if the question arises, what main parts does the right atrium have? The answer is the sinus venarum cavarum and the atrium proper or also called right auricle. Now, what do I find in the right atrium? First, in the sinus venarum cavarum, you have the openings of veins. Two out of those are really big. The superior vena cava has an opening. The inferior vena cava has an opening. 
uh, these are these are the largest ones. And there is a third uh, significantly smaller orifice. One calls this the opening of the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is the vein of the heart that collects the venous blood produced in the cardiac wall and that goes into the right atrium as well. But next week I will come back to this point. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in the embryonic life, there was uh, uh, temporarily a connection between the right ventri uh, sorry, right atrium and left atrium because uh, until birth, the blood has to cross uh, from the left from the right atrium into the left atrium and after birth this connection is closed but the remnant stays and this is the oval fossa one can find this in the um, right atrium uh, as well uh, also in the embryonic life hemodynamically the valve of the inferior vena cava has some significance to direct the blood flow of the inferior vena cava into the oval foramen uh, that uh, allows the passage of the blood from the right atrium into the left one. Um, and um, also uh, on the top one can find this border here which is a quite strong muscular structure called crista terminalis. That is the anatomical border between the sinus venarum cavarum and the atrium uh, proper. Um, one final remark, but I will come back this, to this point again next week. This is the Cox triangle. The sinoatrial node is situated in this triangular region, and uh, the crista terminalis contains the SA node, the sinoatrial node, but um, the conducting system of the heart is a subject or a part of the anatomy to be discussed in the next talk uh, next Tuesday. OK, uh, from here the blood goes on and enters the right ventricle. That happens through an orifice which is designated as the right atrioventricular orifice. Uh, here you have a valve that uh, should direct the blood flow, uh, that should avoid the backflow from the ventricle into the atrium. So you have in this opening a valve. I will come back to this. This is the tricuspid valve. But before I go on, just one remark. Please do not mix up the opening, the right atrioventricular orifice with the tricuspid valve. The structure in the opening is the valve that should avoid that the blood can return to the atrium during the contraction of the ventricle, but you wouldn't mix up the frame of the door with the door. Okay, so the opening is the atrioventricular orifice and the structure that uh, is responsible for the uh, um, determining the direction of the blood flow is the valve and don't mix them up. Um, then we move now to the ventricle. The ventricular anatomy is uh, uh, not that complex. You have uh, the valve basically, which is situated inside the ventricle and that has parts. You have muscles um, into which uh, the uh, tendineous cords are attached. I will come back to the tendineous cords in a minute, but before that happens, I mentioned that the right ventricle has the so-called tricuspid valve, which has most of the times three muscles. You have the anterior and the posterior papillary muscles, which are uh, always uh, found in the heart. And on the interventricular septum, you have some tiny muscle uh, structures that can be designated as septal papillary muscles, but they might be uh, small or uh, eventually they might be absent um, in some cases. So papillary muscles we have in the ventricle. Also, there is a quite strong, well-developed muscle uh, trabecula here, which uh, is arising from the septum and goes to the right margin. One calls this septomarginal trabecula, um, which has some hemodynamic significance and also contains uh, some parts of the conducting system. Next week I will talk about this. Um, and um, also hemodynamically the supraventricular crest has uh, some significance because it's uh, up there and the supraventricular crest should divide the ventricular cavity into a path through which the blood enters. This is the way of the influx where the blood enters from the atrium and this is how the blood exits and uh, these two parts are separated uh, by the supraventricular crest. Now when the blood exits the ventricle it goes into this funnel shaped uh, narrowing area 
one cause this conus arteriosus also uh, from outside conus cordis uh, through which the blood goes and in this darkness one can probably imagine that there is another valve which is the valve of the pulmonary artery but uh, i will come back to this point a bit later so this is what you see um, if you open the right uh, ventricle and uh, after this um, let's uh, let's turn the heart around again and let's cut off the left side of the heart. Now on the top, you can find the left atrium. Down there, you can find the left ventricle. And uh, let's uh, list the anatomical structures visible inside. So if you cut off the uh, left atrium, you find an anatomically quiet boring space. Not that much uh, is there. The, the wall is pretty flat. Uh, you have the left auricle, which I have mentioned earlier already. And um, you have orifices of blood vessels which come from the lungs. As I mentioned also earlier, the pulmonary veins enter. Most of the times we have four pulmonary veins, two from the right side, two from the left side uh, are entering the space. And uh, that's it. After that, the blood already goes down uh, through an orifice again in order to enter the left ventricle. The opening again has a name. Please study that properly. Left atrioventricular orifice is the proper name for that, in which one can find a valve that has two parts only. It's called bicuspid valve or mitral valve also, which has two cusps, as I mentioned. One has the anterior cusp and the posterior cusp, which are, again, attached to the respective papillary muscles, as uh, the anterior cusp and the posterior cusp has then respectively the uh, corresponding papillary muscles called anterior and posterior papillary muscles. Um, the wall of the left ventricle has also muscle uh, trabeculae on the wall. These are called trabeculae carnae, but I will come back uh, to this point in a later slide as well. Okay, so uh, next, what I would like to explain you is the structure of the heart when you cut it at the level of the uh, ventricle somewhere in the middle. And now it's a cross section of the heart. And there you can see uh, the cross section of the left ventricle. There you can see the cross section of the right ventricle. I would like to point out two things here. First of all, the cross section of the, of the left ventricle is round. The cross section of the uh, right ventricle is more or less half moon shaped or pocket shaped or crescent shaped. Um, and please compare the thickness of the cardiac wall as well. Uh, obviously, the left ventricle has a much thicker wall. It is around 10, 12 millimeters uh, in thickness. Additionally, the right, uh, the right atrium, uh, sorry, right ventricle has a has a thinner wall. It is not thicker than three to four millimeters uh, on average. Uh, this part here, I would like to point out which separates the two ventricles from each other. This is designated as the interventricular septum. Now, the interventricular septum, however, it says the name says interventricular and one would imagine that it belongs to both ventricles. Um, to be honest, it is a functionally part of the left ventricle because the uh, contraction of the left ventricle is much uh, more influenced by the interventricular septum than that of the right ventricle. So the interventricular septum has a greater significance in the pumping function of the left ventricle than in that of the right ventricle. And uh, uh, it's a quiet muscle reach structure on its uh, lower part. But if you apply a longitudinal uh, cut plane between the two ventricles, one can see here the cavity of the right ventricle. There is the left ventricle. And here you can see the longitudinally cut interventricular septum. And on the top of the interventricular septum, there is a smaller area that is free of muscle tissue that is called membranous part. And the muscle reach wall is the muscular part. Um, the interventricular septum is a quiet common place for developmental malformations of the heart. In the embryology lectures about the development of the heart, you will hear about the explanation how come that these uh, uh, parts may, may develop uh, um, uh, in, a, in an improper way. So uh, that was the interventricular septum. And uh, after this uh, description, we would move now from the cavities into the valves. Um, the valves of the heart one can uh, put into two categories. We have the cuspid valves first, 
these have been mentioned already. Uh, they are found between the atria and the ventricles, and uh, generally they have cusps, they have tendinous cords, and they have papillary muscles. Uh, the, in this example, we have the uh, bicuspid valve situated between the left atrium and the left ventricle, but the tricuspid valve would be another example for that. Generally, as I mentioned, the cusp, tendinous cord uh, system, and a papillary muscle, each cusp uh, belongs to the structure. Um, then the question is usually, what does the muscle do and how does this uh, structure work? First of all, if the muscle contracts, one would imagine that you pull down the tendinous cords and students many times in the exam also uh, want to explain us uh, that it would open the valve. But this is a very, very uh, uh, bad uh, way of uh, thinking because this is not true. To be honest, uh, in order to understand that, you have to know that the um, papillary muscles contract and they will uh, be responsible for the proper uh, uh, position of the valves in order to avoid that they are reflected towards the atrium so they avoid uh, the backflow. In order to make it understandable, uh, I made an extra slide on that. So uh, look at this figure. Here you can see that the uh, during the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle, this is the time th uh, during which the ventricle is filled up by blood. From the atrium, the blood enters the uh, cavity of the ventricle. The double arrow here uh, points the distance between the uh, origin of the papillary muscle and the uh, plane of the valve. Now, uh, you can see that the tendinous cords are pretty slack at this time, and the valve is open. Now, the heart beats, pumps the blood into the large vessels. Because of this, the heart gets shorter because the entire heart contracts. What does that mean? That means that the distance between the origin of the papillary muscle and the level of the tricuspid valve, the distance is reduced. Please compare the two black double arrows. Now you see that these are closer to each other. So one would expect that the uh, papillary, uh, one would expect that the tendinous cords, that the tendinous cords would be even more uh, relaxed. But in order to avoid that, the papillary muscles themselves contract also and they keep the tendinous cords stretched in order to avoid that the uh, uh, that the valve is turned back into the into the atrium because of the increasing pressure there during the systolic phase of the cardiac cycle so the during the systole the papillary muscle contracts and keeps the tendinous cords stretched in order to avoid that the uh, valve is turned back into the atrium to avoid the backflow. This is how it works. Please memorize this. Okay, um, uh, at approximately half time, uh, here I have an MRI video on the working heart. And please look at the uh, bicuspid valve, how it opens and closes. You can see the closure and the opening, and also the tricuspid valve is visualized on the right side. Um, uh, obviously, it opens and closes the papillary muscles. One can also imagine, and please compare the thickness of the left and the right ventricular wall. It's also obviously visible in the virtual cross section of the beating heart. Okay, uh, there is some contrast agent moving in the in the heart. That's why one can uh, easily recognize these um, uh, moving structures. Uh, after this, I would like to go on with the uh, other kind of cardiac valves. That's the semilunar valves. They have a completely different anatomical structure and functional uh, uh, rationale as well. What you can see here is a superior view of the shortcut uh, aortic valve, aor aortic ascending aorta, and there you can see the valve. And um, uh, they are found, the semilunar valves are situated in the large vessels. One uh, is in the aorta, the other one is situated in the pulmonary trunk, but their uh, anatomical basis is quite, quite similar. Each of which has three parts. They are called in some books cusps or semilunar valvulae in Latin, each of which has three um, uh, parts. One of them is the tense part that is stretched that forms a, like a groove here. It's a quite strong, uh, uh, strong hard anatomical structure. And then you have a soft part, flexit part in Latin, which can be divided into two subunits again. There is one node here in the middle, which is called nodule, and you have two 
half moon shaped surfaces which serve the closure of the valve. These are designated as the lunulae. So in total, the entire valve has three cusps each of which has a nodule and two lunulae, and they will serve the closure, so they close an angle of 120 degrees approximately, and they provide the perfect closure. No papillary muscles needed, no tendinous cords needed, because if the heart beats, the pressure opens the valve. During this time, the blood enters the pockets, and at the time of the diastole, when the ventricular pressure de decreases, then the blood would like to fall back into the ventricle, but it doesn't happen because automatically, because of the pressure circumstances, the valve closes and uh, will um, uh, direct uh, the blood, uh, it avoids that the blood flow directs back, back into the atrium. It is um, responsible for the valve function then. So uh, this is the general structure of the semilunar valves. And let's compare the semilunar valves of the aorta and that of the pulmonary trunk now. So here you have a cross section of the cardiac uh, anatomy at the level of the valves. There is the uh, cuspid valves uh, with, the, the, with those already. This is a superior view, so don't see the, you don't see here the papillary muscles, but you do see the um, the semilunar valves, those are the, um, the cuspidal valves, sorry. These are the seminar ones. I wanted to uh, talk about these now. So uh, this is the cross section of the aorta there. This is the cross section of the pulmonary trunk. And there you can see how they are um, organized. You have a right, a left, um, and the posterior valvula, semilunar cusps or valvulae, right, left, and posterior. In comparison to this, in the pulmonary trunk, you have a right, left, and anterior uh, semilunar cusp or valvula. So the subunits of the valve are differently um, organized, right, left, posterior in the aorta, and right, left, anterior in the pulmonary trunk. You will find this in your class also in the, in the dissecting room uh, practices. So before we go on, um, I show you once again this this uh, image or this uh, drawing. If one would take uh, the knife and one would remove the muscular tissue here, one could prepare this ring system. Uh, fibrous rings is the anatomical name in English. And in these fibrous rings, the valves are incorporated, embedded. Here you have the tricuspid, there you have the bicuspid valve, mm -hmm. and here you have the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. Now. Uh, this structure is quite hard, um, and uh, it has a uh, it has some some connective tissue inside, which serves many things. One is that uh, the muscle fibers arise uh, from this. On one hand, the um, muscle tissue of the ventricles arise here. Tissues arise here, uh, inferiorly, superiorly the atria, and therefore. These fibrous rings will provide not only the mechanical support of the valves, but they also serve as electric insulation between the atria and the ventricles. I will come back to this point next week, but there is a triangular area here called right fibrous trigone, through which a little opening allows the passage of electric signals through the atrioventricular or his bundle. This is the only anatomical place where normally muscle tissue uh, connects the two uh, parts of the heart, the atria with the ventricles. And this is the place where the electric signal can, can pass only normally on the right fibrous trigone. I will come back to this point and I will talk about the His bundle next week. Um, on, on the other hand, the fibrous rings have also great uh, significance in cardiac surgery because if the valve gets sick and one has to replace them with artificial valves, one can uh, insert these valves into the fibrous rings and you can, you can make sutures here in order to fix uh, these prostheses in the heart to, um, to, to, to treat the sick cardiac valves. Nowadays, we don't use these uh, very old valves, but these biological valves or these uh, very modern uh, valves um, are used uh, in cardiac surgery to replace uh, the uh, valves if they get sick. You will learn about this in heart surgery in later semesters. Okay, because time flies, um, I would move now from the valves into the uh, structure of the cardiac wall. 
I would like to uh, show you this scheme. It's a very simple, pretty much simplified cross section of the cardiac wall. And uh, in the histology classes, you will you will get also a slide from the heart. Um, the inner lining of the cardiac cavity is the so-called endocardium. Then you have the muscle tissue, the myocardium. And after that, on the surface, um, you have uh, the pericardium. But the pericardium is a bit tricky because the pericardium has two parts. One part is the serous pericardium, which has again two layers. The one that is directly attached to the myocardium, one calls visceral layer, also epicardium. And separated by a space from this, you have another layer of serous pericardium that's indicated in yellow here. That is the parietal layer of the pericardium, which is again histologically a mesothelium. You know that the mesothelium is a very tiny epithelium, so it has to be supported. And because of this reason, the parietal layer of the serous pericardium is attached to the fibrous pericardium, which is the second part. And that is dense collagenous connective tissue, which will support the pericardium parietal layer. And um, it is no space between the parietal layer and the fibrous pericardium, but there is a space between the visceral layer and the parietal layer, and that is the pericardial cavity. Uh, and uh, the pericardial cavity has some fluid inside. And uh, this fluid shows some similarities with the the fluid found in the joints, you remember the synovial fluid, which oils the surfaces in order to reduce the friction, and that uh, supports the cardiac movements as well. So this um, is the doctor? pericardial cavity. Um, okay. Doctor? Yes. Uh, now this is actually a clinical question. Now some people uh, they insert uh, hyaluronic acid uh, into joints uh, in case there is no fluid. Does this apply to? Uh, not that I know. Not that I know. We don't. We don't do that. Um, the heart can also move uh, uh, properly in the chest cavity if this uh, fluid is uh, not enough. Even if the pericardium is completely removed or at least in part removed, the heart can can still work. So this is not not needed. More uh, commonly, the problem is that the pericardium fluid is excessive amount uh, of that there, and then you have to remove that fluid if it's too much because that really interferes with the cardiac movement. So more frequently, the problem is if it's too much there. Okay. Uh, uh, so we don't replace that fluid. OK, uh, thanks for the question. Um, and uh, now we go on with the uh, with the myocardial uh, organization. Here you can see here you can see uh, the surface of the heart after a very, very precise dissection. One can recognize the orientation of the muscle uh, tissue in the uh, anterior and in the posterior view uh, of the heart, and you can see that it is more or less oblique. Some books will say longitudinal, but it's not exactly longitudinal, it's more oblique. And uh, that goes down, and the muscles will come together in a place at the apex of the heart that is called vortex. Um, the muscle fibers will twist around a certain spot that's called vortex. And from here, uh, those muscles go into the deep. Then the middle layer comes, which is uh, organized in a ring-like circular layer. And the innermost layer of the cardiac wall that corresponds to the papillary muscles and to the trabeculae carnae, I mentioned those earlier, will give you the innermost layer of the cardiac wall that is, again, more or less longitudinal. Some books will use the term, again, uh, oblique. So outside it goes down, uh, inside it goes up, and between you have a ring-like um, uh, organization. And the outer oblique and the inner oblique layer are more or less perpendicular to each other in order to avoid the twisting of the heart when the heart uh, contracts. The atrial structure is much more simple. There are two layers of muscles, the pectinate muscles I would like to point out. I mentioned them already uh, in, the, uh, in the atrium. Um, so this is the myocardial structure. And um, I have uh, one more um, remark on the pericardium to, to, to discuss with you. Um, if I cut off the pericardium uh, by scissors, then I see the heart. Now let's imagine that I take the knife 
and I cut through the large vessels. The uh, superior vena cava, it's not visible, but somewhere here would be the inferior vena cava, the aorta, and the pulmonary trunk. If I cut all of them, I can take out the heart from the pericardial cavity, uh, and after this action, I will get I will get the um, preparation indicated in this figure. So after the removal of the heart, one can find the pericardial uh, cavity without the heart, and there, after cutting off the heart, the large vessels, one can see that the pericardium uh, has so-called reflections. What does that mean? That means that, as I mentioned earlier, the visceral layer of the pericardium reflects into the parietal layer, and this happens around two anatomical uh, area, areas. On one hand, these pericardial reflections you can find around the arteries. So here you can see that around the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, there is a reflection of the pericardium and uh, a much more complex uh, reflection system occurs around the veins, um, around the superior and the inferior vena cava and around the right pulmonary veins and the left pulmonary veins. This system of uh, reflection seems to be quite complex and uh, with some fantasy, it looks like a, a, a T, a letter, a large printed letter T. If you do not uh, see the letter T in there, I will help you. So this, if you highlight, this is the so-called SEPIS T. It's a lying T and <clears throat> the super vena cava, inferior vena cava and the pulmonary veins will form this T. And uh, if you uh, study these reflections in the dissecting room, your uh, instructor, uh, your professor will ask you to introduce your figure, finger into this space behind the arteries and in front of the veins, one finds the transverse pericardial sinus. This is a space which you can uh, touch with your finger after the opening of the pericardial cavity. And if you flip the heart, you pick up the apex of the heart and you place your finger uh, behind the cavity, uh, behind the heart, you can also find this uh, so-called oblique pericardial sinus. This is situated behind the, the heart. Here you cannot pass through with your finger. This is a blind sac. Uh, it's not uh, possible to pass through without breaking the pericardium, but here you can uh, insert your finger and if it enters here, it comes out there behind the arteries. So please touch in the dissecting room the transverse pericardial sinus and the oblique pericardial sinuses. In the clinical practice, they have limited significance. Um, their significance is maybe in the cardiac surgery that heart surgeons may leave um, some uh, drainage tubes in there after a surgery, you know, some excessive fluid is produced and this is drained by the uh, uh, drain tubes which are left um, after surgery in there and after a couple of days surgeons remove those as well from the uh, sinuses. So um, this was the story of the uh, cardiac wall and um, uh, two more things I would like to uh, explain you. You will also talk about this in the practice but um, I think it's better to mention here also the projection of the heart is that what I would like to tell you. So the thoracic skeleton is indicated here. Let's mark the sternal end of the third rib. Let's mark uh, a point on the left third rib uh, next to the sternum, parasternally. Let's mark the sixth costal cartilage and let's mark a point uh, at the medial clavicular line one centimeter medial to that in the, uh, in the fifth intercostal space. If you these four dots connect with, uh, with uh, uh, light uh, curves, you get the, uh, uh, the projection of the heart to the anterior surface of the chest. If you connect these two endpoints with an oval, you get the plane of the valves, and there you can find the uh, pulmonary trunk just behind the end of the third costal cartilage. Then uh, right behind the sternum at the level of the third intercostal space, you find the aortic orifice. And then you find the venous orifices between the atria and the ventricles. The projection of the left atrioventricular orifice is behind the sternal end of the left fourth costal cartilage. And there uh, behind the sternal end of the fifth costal cartilage, you find the right atrioventricular orifice. So these are the valves. Uh, projections onto the anterior surface uh, of the of the chest wall. 
sometimes important because if you study an X-ray of the chest and they are calcified, one can see sometimes uh, um, uh, the shadows of the deposited calciums, calcium in the uh, anatomical places of the valves. And what you will also do in the class that you will listen to the to the to the sound to the cardiac sound. Uh, you will uh, use a stethoscope and in the second intercostal space on the parasternal line, you will listen to the aortic uh, valve on the same spot, but on the left side, you will listen to the pulmonary trunk. Then you go to the um, um, uh, tricuspid valve. If you want to listen to the tricuspid valve, that is here that you can hear in the fifth intercostal space and above the apex of the heart, you will hear the bicuspid valve. These are the auscultation points when you listen to the cardiac valves. Uh, this you will study uh, also in your uh, in your clinical uh, practice. And um, uh, yes, a question. Yes. Uh, what's the differences between the apex and the bicuspid valve? I mean, the apex. The apex is the tip of the heart. That is an anatomical structure. The bicuspid valve has uh, at the same place the auscultation point. So if you put the stethoscope onto the place of the apex of the heart, you will hear the bicuspid valve when it closes. So this is the place where uh, is the best place to listen to the to the valve. OK, so above the, the apex of the heart, uh, you find the bicuspid valve's auscultation point. This is what uh, you have to learn about that. OK, um, and um, uh, I also have uh, one more remark. This is easy on a uh, chest skeleton, but uh, if you have a patient who comes in, um, you have to find your orientation also on the chest wall if you don't see the bones. So you have to practice this and in the internal medicine in the third year, um, you will have classes uh, how to find these spots. But if you don't have the anatomical background of this knowledge, you won't be able to listen to the cardiac valves because you're, uh, you cannot find your orientation on the chest wall. So this is something that you have to learn and you have to practice. And this starts also in the anatomy department. So in the next weeks, you will be able to listen to the uh, uh, cardiac valves in the dissecting room, of course, on each other, on a living person. Um, one can examine these easily. OK, and uh, the last slide of mine is uh, about the X-ray of the heart. Um, this um, slide uh, is a half topic already, what you can find in the list of exam topics. Uh, <coughs> there is no difference between the two X-rays, but what I would like to uh, do here is that I just mark the shadows which you have to study. So midline shadow, what we have now in X-ray, and many anatomical structures are in there but I don't want to talk <laughs> about those now in detail. Uh, what I have to point out is the diaphragm here. This is an important landmark for orientation. And um, on the right side, one can see the shadow of the superior vena cava. And below that, uh, or sorry, on the left side of that, the aorta makes a curve. And this typically makes a kind of um, uh, elongated, sometimes oval, uh, protrusion bulging structure here. That's the shadow of the aorta. Then the pulmonary trunk comes here. And uh, that's the second arch here. After that, um, on the right side, you have the right atrium that forms again an arch here. And uh, below this, um, on the left side, you have the left atrium that forms again an, a kind of shadow there. And below these, you have the ventricles, but they will in part be projected into the diaphragm also, and some abdominal organs also cover them. So this is the shadow of the uh, right ventricle, and this is the shadow of the left uh, uh, ventricle here. And um, this is how you, you, you can imagine uh, the structures on the X-ray uh, of the heart. So. Uh, we are already behind schedule and uh, thanks for the questions. Probably that's why also I made it uh, four minutes longer. Uh, sorry about this. Um, what I wanted to tell you, but the time is out, so I don't want to uh, take your time away. These two plants uh, you can find in the uh, forest also. Um, these are the foxgloves, the woolly one and the common foxglove. Uh, these were the plants which people used to extract from uh, from those digoxin and digitoxin, 
and uh, these plants were very useful to make medicines and these have been used earlier for the patients who suffered on heart failure because these um, medicines could increase the contractibility of the heart and uh, this, uh, these agents were used for the treatment of, uh, of heart failure. Nowadays, uh, very rarely uh, are these um, uh, medicines used and we don't use the plants anymore, but please, if you see these plants, don't collect them because they are highly uh, poisonous uh, as well, uh, but they have some uh, clinical significance. They used to have some clinical significance in the uh, heart treatments. So um, thanks for your attention again. And uh, next Tuesday, I will talk about the blood supply of the heart and the innervation conducting system with clinical implications. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice day. Thanks for coming.